may the Lord bless you all, my beloved brothers and sisters, and all of those persons who take time to hear the audio, where we shall be learning many things, rules to live a righteous life before the Lord, to live the way to please the Lord in all things. Since I have been asked many questions, I am going to try to answer a few of them. So let us begin with a few answers on some of these questions. I know those that ask the questions are those that are new in the church, those possibly that are not even in the church, those who are simply just beginning, those who are beginning to hear the doctrine, the word of the Lord. So I see these questions. It is for you all with great love. I want to clarify the best way that I can any questions you may have. For example, the first question they ask, what are the extraterrestrials? These extraterrestrials are spiritual beings, beings that are not physical here on the earth. They are spirits. Let us remember that the Lord, when he punished the devil and he cast him out from his presence, he sent the devil with all his millions of angels that followed him these angels became spirits so they are all in space and this is why there have been many people who have seen these visions you could call them or they see these experiences with these supernatural beings and the people think that they are extraterrestrials or that they're ufos well they give these things so many names well let them put whatever name they want what I want to clarify to he that asks a question is that they are spirits. And since they have power, they can transform themselves into any form, any character, simply to deceive the people so that the people are there thinking and believing in them. What are they? What are they doing? So do not worry about these things. What is important is to have God in our heart so that all of those being or spirits do not come to disturb our peace or our life or to remove or take away the spirituality that we need to have with the Lord. That is the extraterrestrials. They are spirits. Another question. So here you're going to realize that now it's another subject, always. The next question is about reincarnation. Is there reincarnation? Because John the Baptist, it says, had the spirit of Elijah the prophet. Well, let me answer quickly. No, there does not exist reincarnation. And there was no reincarnation in John the Baptist when it says that he worked and manifested himself with the power of Elijah. What the Lord gave John the Baptist was the portion of the Spirit of God that God had given Elijah to do miracles and signs so that he could have power. The Lord gave Elijah a portion of his Spirit. When Elijah dies or disappeared, that portion of the Spirit, the Lord conserved it and reserved it to give to John the Baptist. This is why it says that when John the Baptist began to minister and to serve preaching regarding the Lord Jesus Christ, regarding the kingdom of heaven, says that he had the power and the spirit of Elijah, but it was of God, the power of God and the portion of the spirit of God that Elijah had. He had John the Baptist. So there is no reincarnation that does not exist. The Lord Jesus clearly taught that when any person dies in the final judgment, everyone will have to stand before the presence of God to be judged. And one goes to eternal life and the others go to be condemned. That is what the Bible teaches. Another subject. Next question. 
Someone asks, what does it mean or what what are spiritual bonds? Spiritual bonds are restraints that someone has to grow spiritually or an obstacle. Weaknesses, you could call them. Vices, perhaps. And this person has that. They cannot pray, for example. They cannot search for the Lord or read the Bible. They don't feel joy in their heart or happiness or wanting to do something because there's some that is binding or preventing that person from being willing in their heart to serve the Lord, to glorify and honor the Lord. So that becomes, or that vice spiritual bond that the enemy has placed in their body. That's what it becomes in restraints, spiritual bonds, shackles, impediments. And the person does try hard to pray to seek God and he can't. The person tries to change, to turn away from sin, and they can't. That is what is called a shackle. Impediments. So for those that suffer from these problems, pray and ask the Lord to deliver you. Say, Lord, deliver me and remove all of these impediments that I have in my life. And this that does not allow me to search with a clear heart, to search in spirit and truth. Very well. Another question. A question they asked was, what is predestination? That they've read in the Bible about predestination. Predestination is before something happens. It is because the Lord chose us or the Lord made the universe or the Lord created the world before making Adam and Eve. It says that the Lord had made all in the heavens where he dwells. That the Lord made all the crucifixion as well. The salvation, the souls, the church, everything that the Lord has been creating, all was made with the Lord before the universe was made. When the Lord made Adam and Eve, all had already been made in the heavens, in those heavenly places. The Lord had done so and had chosen us as well. The Lord is power and he can do all things. So this is why we are predestined, meaning we were chosen from before there even existed man and woman on earth. We were predestined to eternal life, to gain salvation, to be with our Lord. This is what it means, the word predestination. Very well. Another subject. And some persons or some brothers and sisters, they consult and ask during this time, this season, the end of the year during December, where many festivities are celebrated, there are many superstitions or customs or holidays, people prepare traditional meals and people prepare gifts and they prepare certain meals and they do all these type of things. Some brothers and sisters ask, I live with my parents. They're not in church or I live with my aunt or uncle or I live with my husband and he doesn't go to church or vice versa. He says, I live with my wife. And she and her family don't go to church. I'm the only one. What do we do? How do we do? What is the, what do we do with dinner or the invitations? Well, you have to act and proceed wisely and with prudency. Don't belittle a meal, be wise. And simply, you're not going to be there participating with the prayers, with certain songs or repetitive prayers, no. saints or figures or images, none of these things. Simply don't participate, but you can receive a dinner because you have to be well-mannered in that aspect. But some say, well, what happens is I'm in church, we go to church, and we have a business, we own a business. And in this business, for example, in sales, in this month, there are sales of many particular items that are sold during this month. There's lights, decorations, certain flowers, ribbons. They sell images, idols. They sell saints. Everything that has to do with Christmas. Mangers, 
and they ask me, is it bad that we sell these types of things? Well, I think that, yes, the brothers and sisters of the church, those that are already converted and in the church and know the plan of God, you know what is good and bad. I think that it looks bad that if you and your business are selling these types of articles, idols of these saints, for example, the figure of the baby Jesus or of Joseph or of the Virgin Mary, of all these types of saints and angels, all these types of images and decorations that have to do with this month of Christmas, the brothers and sisters, I think that that is not correct that you sell these things because you know the doctrine and then the Lord comes in to charge you because you don't have the conviction. That is lack of conviction, lack of certainty in God, lack of believing and giving your heart to the Lord. Truly lack of knowledge of the doctrine. So then the Lord is not going to bless you. If you are someone that is not of the church, you are not brothers and sisters of the church and you have a business and you sell these articles well, perhaps today the Lord is not going to charge them because they are ignoring the truth. They ignore the doctrine. But those that do know the doctrine turn away from this, sell other products, sell other articles that do not have to do with idolatry because the Lord is a jealous God. You know this. You know that God is a jealous Lord and you will not prosper. You will not progress. You will not succeed or have blessings from the Lord. If you are greedy and then to have better sales or to have a better business, you're going to sell all of these types of things, promoting or showing idolatry in a certain way. So this question is for the brothers and sisters of the church who ask if they can, if they have this type of business, other questions, brothers and sisters, as well, whom are alone in the church, for example, not their whole family goes to church, only some, some do not. And they say, now there are marriages in the church of a certain religion. There's a marriage being arranged or a baptism is being arranged or a first communion, et cetera, et cetera. And since there's a division in my family, some are in the church and some are not. So here we have arguments or a discord because of this. What do we do? What do we do? So if you go to church, if you are a believer of the church, but within your house, in your household, part of your family, whether it be husband or wife, mother or father, children, you are part of this marriage, certain family member, and you have to go to this certain religion and there is a reception and you say, what do I do? Do I participate? Do I not? I would say that you could with prudency participate in the reception, go to the dinner or the gathering or go to the afterwards, but don't participate in the actual ceremony that's in the religious place and that certain religion, whatever religion it might be that is out of our Lord of spirit and truth. It is better that you don't attend those places because the Lord will remove blessings and will not help you extend his hand because of that. For the Lord is a jealous God. So be wise. If you're in your house, eat, receive the dinner invitation and eat. But for example, there's a couple spouses and they have their children. The wife goes to church she knows the word of the Lord and she knows the things of God, the work of our God. And the husband is not of the church, but he is of a traditional religion. For example, let's say that. So he forces her, for example, that the children need to be baptized. So sister, my advice, you simply say, I'm not going to make any effort for any gathering or party or celebration. I'm not going to put my money into any baptism. I'm not going to organize or the first communion because you see that that is not correct before the Lord. All of those things that were made up by religious traditions, they've made all these things up by man to simply get money. 
So since you know that those things should not be done, you're not going to participate in organizing it or paying and you're not going to do anything. Let your husband do everything. Let him pay for it. Let him decorate the house. Let him buy the food. Let him organize. And simply you sit down and maybe you'll eat a plate of food later, but you're not participating or vice versa. If the husband is the one that is in church seeking the things of God, a true gospel, and the wife is the one who insists that the children need to be baptized or have their first communion or whatever, the husband does the same thing. Just tell her, I'm not going to give you money for those expenses. Figure out where you'll get the money from and figure out how you'll throw your party and your things because I'm not going to participate because I'm already attending the church where I'm seeking a living God, a God who is spirit and truth. I want the Lord to bless me. I'm not going to offend God with any of these things. So in this manner, we could do this. That each one does their gathering with their own means, with their own money. This we need to do so, let us say, with wisdom, with great prudency. For there are so many religious beliefs, and especially there are religious traditions. They have a power over the, over the people. So the people, the family, they come and attack the poor brother and sister or the youth or whoever might be in the family and then they become the enemy. So act with wisdom. But try as well to please the Lord because the main point is to please God. For once we know the doctrine, we have to please our Lord. Another question that I'm being asked is regarding superstitions there are so many superstitions millions there are of superstitions and beliefs millions and there are so many in latin america in europe the u.s in every country there are superstitions beliefs folk tales one believes one thing the other believes another we do not have time to list all that exists in the world but what do we do as children of god as followers of the gospel of our lord jesus christ we should turn away from all of those things do not give credit to it do not pay attention to it not put our heart in it because this is what displeases the lord we have to be realistic and take a practical approach have a heart clean, pure, not make any of these things valid. For example, there are those that pay attention to the change of the moon. For example, they say that, they, oh, the change of the moon, that they have to cut their hair. Oh, that when it's a full moon, that when it's half moon. Oh, don't cut your hair unless it's half moon because then it doesn't grow. Or don't plant. You can't plant any seeds in the field because the moon have to be in this position or that position. Or don't gather the fruits until the moon is a moon or half moon or full moon. And this is what people say. And they put all of these beliefs. Don't be enslaved to these things don't enslave yourself to these superstitions or to all these customs don't enslave yourself don't make these things valid in your life be direct practical and be mature in your way of thinking of acting and proceeding be logical put logic to everything you do and you will see how you will not suffer or make anyone else suffer so be practical and realistic and don't make any of these things valid because they do not have any tendency to be of value or utilized in our spiritual life or in our joy or peace. None of these things help us to reach happiness or peace or blessings from God. On the contrary, it turns us away from him. So we need to begin to be realistic and forget these details or forget this of certain colors. You have to wear certain color for good luck. All of this, abandon it for its lies and things that the world created, traditions that made things up from the devil. The devil has created all these things to deceive the people. So don't be enslaved to these things. I would like to read, brothers and sisters, a few verses in the Bible. In Revelation, Revelation 18, let us go to Revelation 18, Revelation, the last book of the Bible, verse 2. Here in Revelation, it speaks of a woman, of a harlot, and she has the name of Babylon, 
But this Babylon truly is not a physical city or a physical country. But this Babylon is a symbolism. It is the symbol of the gathering of so many men and women in the world who have allowed themselves to fall in sin, to commit sin, to live in sin, and offend God. So this woman, Babylon, it seems in the metaphoric way or, or symbolical way, is representing the sin and the wickedness of all mankind, of all the religions, of all of those religions that are turned away from the true Lord. Because we say there are millions of religions, but all of those millions of religions are not with God. They don't have God. So all they gathering, they do wicked acts. And each one, the gathering of all of this wickedness and sin, of all these religions and all of the mankind in the world, it has been gathered in one name that the Lord placed, a harlot woman. And he calls it Babylon. So here in Revelation, I invite you to read all that has to do with Babylon, where you're going to realize that this Babylon or this woman, not physical, but is a symbol or an example. This woman has been filled with wickedness and sin, has gathered all the wickedness to go against God. And the Lord one day shall punish her. She will have an end and a punishment in the final judgment. So in this verse, verse number two, or for example, I'm going to read in verse 15, chapter 17, which is talking about this harlot that refers to Babylon herself. The angel says to John, the apostle John, who's seeing the visions and the Lord is showing him many things that were going to happen in the world in the world that we live. It says that the angel spoke to John in verse 15 of chapter 17, John, the angel says to John, the waters which you saw where the harlot sits, because he saw a woman, a harlot sitting upon many waters. And look at the symbolism here. The angel explained the waters, which you saw where the harlot sits are peoples, multitudes, nations, and tongues. As you can realize the symbolism of that harlot, that woman, or that Babylon. Now in chapter 18, verse 2, it says that the angel cried, it says, the great Babylon is fallen, is fallen. Pay attention to what it says here, what it was, what this woman was. The great is fallen and has become a dwelling place of demons. The demons are the ones that dwell in that harlot, in that woman, in that Babylon, because it is the gathering of all of the wickedness and all of the sin of mankind that has come against God. So I said it's become a dwelling place of demons, a prison for every foul spirit and a cage for every unclean and hated bird. Look at the magnitude of this harlot woman, this woman, the sin, as I said before, that in the world, the enemy has planted so much idolatry, so much superstition, folk tales, so many things to turn the people away from the Lord. And here in Revelation, the Lord is mentioning that all gathered together will form a harlot, a woman dwelling place of demons and a prison of every foul spirit. And if we observe in the world, we see that it is full and plagued of witchcraft, curses in all places, in every country, witchcraft and curses are abundant spells. All of this is these unclean spirits working and doing harm of one towards another, the people hurting other people. And using all of these demons and all of these spirits to do so. That is that Babylon. And in verse 11, it states that this Babylon or that harlot woman 
is that dwelling place of demons, was that prison, and that cage or unclean spirit, that hated bird. In verse 11, it says that mankind and the merchants of the earth, there was a merchant of a market of this same belief, of this same idolatry, of this curses, witchcraft, the sin of every aspect, they began with these markets, mankind. And as I said before, the brothers and sisters who have their business and they're selling these idols and images, these dolls, whatever you want to call them, all of this is what it says in verse 11. And the merchants of the earth will weep and mourn over her, this harlot, this Babylon, for no one buys their merchandise anymore. For here it refers to the moment that the end arrived for that mer that harlot, that where woman. she would be cast into the lake of fire. And no one would buy her merchandise. And the merchants, they would weep because they could no longer sell their products. Merchandise of gold and silver, precious stones and pearls, fine linen and purple, meaning cloth, silk and scarlet, every kind of citron wood, every kind of object of ivory, every kind of object of most precious wood, bronze, iron and marble, and cinnamon and incense, fragrant oil and frankincense, you see this incense, the odors, wine and oil, fine flour and wheat, cattle and sheep, horses, chariots and bodies and souls of men. That even as well, the markets are in the souls of men, those that sell their soul to the devil and those that buy their soul from the devil in the, mer in the markets. As you can see, if we read all of this chapter 18, this is what we are seeing and observing in mankind. And the people and all of these merchants all use these special days, these holidays, these festivities of saints and virgins and all these types of things that were created and man made up and the birth of Jesus what birth of Jesus? God is not a child. He is not a being. He had no beginning or end. The Lord is spirit. He had no birth. And to say that he is born now in December is blasphemy against the Lord. But all of that, as you can hear, is merchants. And the merchants, who are the owners of all of these marketplaces, selling their products, and showing their enthusiasm to others. But each one for their own ambition, wanting their sales, they do not care of pleasing the Lord. What they want is to sell without being careful that they should not do these things. They're not going to die of hunger. God will provide in another way for they to live. They do not need to promote any types of these merchandise that has to do with idolatry and to turn away from God. So this is a, a very short reflection because I would extend even more, but there I limit myself just a little bit of answer for you to clarify regarding the markets, the merchants, those that do not do the will of the Lord, turn away from God for their own greed. So you see that all of us who have believed in the Lord, we have to turn away from all of that. Let us please God and let us live a righteous life before him. And let us not worry for we will not die of hunger. Why do you have to regret and say, oh, look, I wanted to be there in that feast. I wanted to be there at that holiday dinner. No, the Lord first. We have to love the Lord above all things. So we have to sacrifice God first and then our delight, our own pleasures, that of the flesh, dinners, drinks, gatherings, adornments, decorations, idols, all these things we have to abandon. And those that sell these products and make them, be careful. 
because the hand of God will always be there to bless or to punish. Very well. Let us pray to our Lord and ask the Lord to give us wisdom and intelligence. And may the Lord reveal to you, reveal the true path of the Lord. And if you have doubts, pray to the Lord, ask him and say, Lord, reveal to me, show me what I am doing. Teach me because I want to please you. And the Lord will teach you so that he will hear your prayer so that you can please the Lord. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, eternal Lord, we thank you, eternal Lord. You made the heaven and the earth. You created us with your powerful hand, and you gave us laws, rules, commandments, and you taught us, Lord. You told us that we should not worship idols, objects, or many things or creatures to adore and follow them as if they are our gods. Because you, O Lord, taught there is only one true God, which is you, a living God of power, a God in spirit and truth. For this, O Lord, we ask that you help us. Look at all the people, O Lord, that hear the teachings because they want to learn of you. Help each one, O Lord, each man and woman, that in their heart they feel the desire and need to learn, to follow your path, and to leave the ignorance, to leave the sin aside. Extend your hand, O Lord, and help them, bless them, deliver them, break the yoke of slavery, the chains and the traps of the enemy, the bondage of which they are restrained, deliver them and remove curses and spells so you can give them wisdom and understanding and they can comprehend and understand your way and your true word. Give them dreams, visions, reveal to them your path, teach each one, Heavenly Father, have mercy of the people, O Lord. Mercy of those souls that call upon you, that ask for your mercy. Blessed Lord, eternal my Lord, extend your hand, O Lord, as well on all those that are sick. Deliver and cleanse and heal, O Lord. But heal the soul as well and give them knowledge to all. Knowledge of your true doctrine, of your true path, which goes to eternal life. Thank you, my Father, and all these petitions, all of this plea I ask in the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved Son, Lord, so that you have mercy upon all of us and take us always towards the light and take us to the path of righteousness, that we live a righteous life, a life full of blessing, of triumphs and victories in our spiritual life, that we have peace, that we have joy in our being, and that we may offer peace as well to others, that we be a good example and testimony to the world, to all the people that surround us. Thank you, my Father. Bless, O oh Lord, to all of the people. Give them deliverance, blessing, prosper, bless as well the children, and give healing, for there are many children that have an illness. Bless and guide to the path of righteousness. Thank you, my Father. In the glorious name of Jesus Christ, your beloved son, I ask all for he be the glory, the honor and the praise for now and evermore. Let us sing to the Lord chorus 202. It's a new chorus. It has not yet been recorded. It has not yet been released in the CDs, but we're going to sing to begin learning the melody, the chorus 202. My only thought it is of you, O Lord. Mi pensamiento eres tú, Señor. 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 Porque tú eres mi buen pastor. Me alimentas con tu amor. Y tu palabra me da vigor, seguro estoy, porque tú eres mi buen pastor, me alimentas con tu amor, y tu palabra me da vigor, seguro estoy. Mi pensamiento eres tú, Señor. 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 
porque tú eres mi buen pastor, me alimentas con tu amor, y tu palabra me da vigor, seguro estoy, porque tú eres mi buen pastor, me alimentas con tu amor, y tu palabra me da vigor, seguro estoy. Glory be to the Lord. Thank you, my beloved brothers and sisters. May God bless you. And until the next time, I love you in the Lord.